Could I ask all? Could I ask all of you to sit down, get a seat, and could I ask the staff in the room to close the doors? If you need chairs, there are plenty up here in front. Come on in, make yourselves comfortable. All right. Thank you for joining us this morning. Welcome to everyone. We're celebrating 20 years of blood safety and the Ricky Ray Act. I'm very excited for this session and the reunion of the individuals who both individually and collectively made such an impact on hemophilia and the bleeding disorders community over 20 years ago. While this morning's speakers have, have been um, both political and in health policy worlds for a long time, we've asked them to tell us a more personal story today. Their impressions of the environment back in the early 90s, how the HIV crisis and its impact on the bleeding disorders community impacted their work, and their sense of what was accomplished by both the Institute of Medicine report and the HIV blood supply and the Ricky Way Act. This is also a very personal session for me. I had never been involved uh, nationally with NHF. I was a guy living in San Francisco, working at camp. I was involved in my chapter a bit and some of the state politics there. Um, but what moved me uh, was not only my own personal situation, but the fact that my little boys at camp were succumbing to HIV. That's what moved me to Washington. As many of you know, the Ricky Ray Act brought me to DC. I joined the NHF policy team, and for five years we were working on this bill and the broader issues impacting the hemophilia community. This is where I began to realize the strength of our community when we worked together, when we worked side by side, hand in hand. That's the power in this community. With that, let me begin the session. I want to introduce my dear friend, fellow advocate, Dana Kuhn, president of PSI. And many of my fellow advocates who work on Ricky Ray, I see a lot of familiar faces. Ellis is in the aisle. Gary Cross is out there. I saw a lot of familiar faces. If I didn't mention your name, it wasn't because I didn't see you, but there's a long list of you. And I'm, I'm so glad you're still here with us today. I want to thank Dana for working with NHF <coughs> to organize the session and for reaching out to our special guest, Donna Shalala, the former Secretary of Health and Human Services under President Clinton and the current president of the University of Miami. Please join me in welcoming Dana Kuhn. Thank you, Val. Uh, this is gonna be an exciting session. We have a, a, a host of people here that are just experts at this and helped us get through this time in history with great success. But um, the first thing I want to do is I want to let you know that this is going to be a, what I'm about to share with you is a historical um, perspective that I have had, a personal historical perspective, um, which led to blood safety and the creation of the Ricky Ray Hemophilia Relief Fund Act. By no means am I claiming that I did this single-handedly because there were many people sitting in this room who made this happen. I was just one of the many catalysts that, ha that got involved here in, in the Ricky Ray and in blood safety. But let me go back to 1983. I was living in Tennessee at the time, and I had just graduated from seminary, and I was newly ordained in, as a Presbyterian minister. Life was good. I had a wife, and I had a three-year-old and five-year-old. You had the perfect family, and I was moving on. Thank you, Olin Mills. Yeah. <laughs> so one day, um, as I was in ministry, I participated in a charitable fundraising basketball game, and upon rebounding a ball, I came down upon my foot the wrong way, and it broke. I went to the ER because I had mild hemophilia, 
and I needed to get an infusion of genetic factor replacement. I have mild hemophilia, so I never needed to be infused before. I asked for a blood product called cryoprecipitate, and as you know, that was made from about anywhere from 12 to 24 uh, persons pooled blood. But instead, I was infused with a factor eight concentrate, which was um, over 60,000 pooled blood donors. So on March 4th, 1983, the Centers for Disease Control announced that it is highly likely that HIV was in the blood products taken by hemophiliacs. I was infused with the blood product on March 26, 1983, 22 days after this publication came out. Three days after the infusion, I found myself ended up in the hospital, and I had something called non-A, non-B hepatitis. It seemed to be the acceptable risk. And uh, I was infused with the, with the product which caused this. There were no treatments at that time except really fluids and rest. And it took me about six months to get over the effects of this to get back to at least a halfway normal life. In 1986, when the HIV test was, became ver readily available, I was attending a hemophilia clinic and was tested for HIV, as was the protocol for people with hemophilia. I was told I should have nothing to worry about since I only took factor once. And uh, mind you, most people with hemophilia are treated weekly. The clinic uh, said, let's test you. They tested me, the lab came back, and it was positive for HIV, to their amazement. And they said it must be a false positive. And they sent it off again, and it came back positive again. At that time, I was counseled about the sexual transmission of HIV, and I was told you would have to use precautionary measures with sexual intimacy. So my wife and I, use those precautionary measures religiously, no pun intended. <laughs> but to do the math, in 1983, I was infused with the uh, infected product. I tested in 1986, made known about it in 1986, and there were three years of risk of exposure to my wife. In 1987, my wife developed bronchial problems, which were success, unsuccessfully treated. She was hospitalized May 5th, 1987, and it was discovered that she was HIV positive, but moreover, she was diagnosed with an AIDS opportunistic infection called pneumocystis perini pneumonia. The only treatment in 1987 was AZT, and AZT, had to, you had to petition the FDA to be able to use the, uh, the, um, the, the product, and you had to gain their permission to use it and it was, as it was not officially approved. It took three weeks to get the product. Unfortunately, before we could attain the product, Patty died on May 27, 1983. Now I became the sole parent of a three-year-old and a five-year-old preschool children. I was left to help my children deal with the most traumatic experience a child could experience in their life, the loss or death of their mother. I was tortured personally with the thoughts that I had unknowingly caused her death. I left the ministry, moved to Virginia, where I could properly raise the children with my family support. So in order to afford my COBRA insurance, I took a construction job with my brother in order to get the money. Probably not the smartest thing to do for a person with hemophilia. Anyway, I needed to pay those bills. And while working with my brother, I tripped over some debris at a construction site, ended up getting a hematoma on my shin, and found myself traveling to the emergency room at Virginia Healthcare Systems in Richmond, Virginia. And there I was treated with a non-blood product and during that time I was treated, I met a hematologist, and he asked me why I was there, and by the end of the evening he said to me, how would you like to have a job? And I said, sure, doing what? And he said, well, I would like you to help us build the counseling, 
program here for people with expensive chronic illnesses. When I took the job as the clinical counselor with VCU Health Systems, the physician who I worked with, who I just mentioned, he plopped a box of documents and all kinds of articles on my desk, and he said, this is homework for you to learn about HIV transmission. As I went through the documents, I found a smoking gun in our US blood collection system. The smoking gun was the cause, and the cause of leading, which led to the HIV infection of 90% of the 10,000 severe hemophiliacs in the United States, most who lost their lives within, ten, within five years. Through the F Freedom of Information Act, the documents I collected and who other people gave me these documents, we've formulated into a 500-page chronicle document entitled The Trail of AIDS in the Hemophilia Community. And it was at that time I started writing letters to Secretary of Health and Human Services, Donna Shalala, trying to point out the hemophilia pandemic as well as the business of blood collection. It was also at that time I had to decide whether I would become or I would take the risk to become a voice of people who had no voice. And if you recall, many in our community were reluctant to be associated with HIV and AIDS. But I thought, what do I have to lose? I already lost someone near and dear to me, my wife. And my parents could take care of my children, so what did I have to lose? I could be a voice. So in 1992, I took the book to the, or this document to Senators Ted Kennedy, Bob Graham of Florida, and Representative Porter Goss of Florida. And these members realized the danger to the American public and demanded a congressional investigation of the Secretary of Health and Human Services. But instead, she, in, instead she ordered a national study by the prestigious Institute of Medicine, National Academy of Science. It was at that point we also had a hearing as this community, and many people told how this had affected their life and brought some of the issues that they understood was in documentation. And we shared those documents with an IOM specialist, Michael Soto, and Lauren Levinson. And we spent many, time, many years doing this, two years approximately. So in 1995, the official study was completed and an executive summary was published. And it stated on here, the contamination of the nation's blood supply by HIV was due to inadequate institutional decision making and a failure of leadership in 1983 and 84. The failure led to less than effective donor screening weak regulations, and insufficient communication to patients about the risk of acquiring AIDS through the blood supply. It also said that there were missed opportunities to learn from local attempts to screen potentially infected donors or to implement other control strategies that had been rejected as national policy. And I really believe that was one of the statements that Secretary Shalala had said, and holding up a document. Fourteen recommend recommendations came out of the study, of the IOM study, and all but one have been fulfilled to today. The Secretary of Health and Human Services um, appointed the Advisory Committee of Blood Safety and Availability to oversee the implementation of these recommendations. I was the first patient consumer she appointed to serve on the cabinet or this national level committee. Glenn Pierce, as you know, followed thereafter. When the next stage of our life, due to the publishing of the Institute of Medicine report, out of that came the platform and the springboard for developing the Ricky Ray Hemophilia Relief Act. And, you know, I had the privilege of working with Louise Ray, Val Bias, who was brought to D.C. to start to make sure we spearheaded that, 
I had the privilege of working with the Committee of 10,000 and the many people who were spearheading that avenue, Hemophilia Federation of America, and <coughs> with the DECA students, which Ella Seltzer organized, and many of the courageous people who still sit in this room who voiced their opinions and took messages to the OIG. I think it was the beginning of nothing about us without us. The Ricky Ray Hemophilia Relief Act, as we all know, was in 1995. It was in the uh, October of 1995, and Kennedy, Graham, and Goss supported it, and so did Newt Gingrich. Um, the bill provided HIV-infected hemophiliacs or their survivors with $100,000 compensation. The bill was passed on November 12, 1998, Public Law 105-369, and was funded at $850 million at the end of the Clinton administration in October 2001. It took six years to pass this bill. The bill went down in history as the largest funded piece of legislation advocated by patient consumers in this hemophilia community. What a privilege we had to do that. So although I've shared a personal story with you, and that I was a catalyst of this, it's not all about me, and some of these you can see the that President Clinton funded it. You can see where Tom Bliley said that this was something that was amazing that we did. But it's not all about me. I present this historical perspective to humbly and gratefully introduce you to a national leader whom, if she did not take the stance that she took to lead, we would not have a safe blood supply, we would not have the Ricky Ray Hemophilia Relief Act, we would not have new and improved safe plotting products, and we would not have a nation that would be vigilant over the possibility of a next emerging health crisis. I don't believe that she has received the recognition she deserves for all she accomplished for this nation and our community. So today, we want to hear from former Secretary of Health and Human Services and the President of the University of Miami, Donna Shalala, and to learn how she saw the public policy related to HIV and AIDS and, and how she faced this during her office. And so with this, we also want to honor her for the accomplishments of safeguarding the nation's blood supply. So it is my privilege and my honor to welcome Donna Shalala to this platform. taller before I came to Washington. Um, Dana, thank you very much uh, for that very nice introduction. I don't think of myself as a hero when it comes to the nation's blood supply because there were so many people, uh, some of them up here uh, who participated and the advocates in particular, all of them, uh, including my good friends, uh, Karen and Gary Cross and Dana, I mean, everyone, uh, everyone played an absolute critical role. Let me take you back to the, uh, 
to the beginning of the Clinton administration, but even back before that. And I'm going to talk a little about the principles and how they got to where they were, because they're, the backgrounds of the people that President Clinton put in place were absolutely critical. You cannot underestimate appointments. Um, you can all talk about the presidents and whether they're advocates uh, on issues, but it's very important who that president appoints and what kinds of direction and support the president uh, uh, gives. Uh, when the campaign, um, the series campaign for president actually starts uh, in about um, a year, there will be some college dropout that follows uh, the presidential candidates. Each of them will have their own college dropout. And um, they'll have their own little computer. And every time that president makes a promise, uh, that college dropout will record it. And this is actually the context for public policy uh, that most people actually never hear. And at the end of the campaign, whoever wins, they compile that what is essentially a book of promises. And those of us on the inside call it promises, promises. And they kind of split it up for each cabinet officer. And the president calls you in and hands you your part. And you look at the kind of commitments that the candidate made and you think, oh my god, he didn't say that, did he? <laughs> But it is essentially um, in, during the campaign in which the commitments are made and the priorities come out of the campaign. And so in President Clinton's case, because he had had experience with AIDS, because he had had friends who had died, he was very clear about the priority and the focus of his administration. But long before that, those people that he was going to bring in, because of where they came from and where their roots were, um, they became very important players. And let me talk a little, let me say a little, couple things about myself. I actually came from Wisconsin uh, to the administration. I had known the Clintons uh, forever. I knew them from the time they graduated from law school, but I knew them through my New York connections because I went to Wisconsin from New York. I was in New York during the 1980s. I was actually president of Hunter College in New York when the AIDS crisis started to build up. And that becomes important because of where we were and what we experienced. It shaped our own personal passionate commitments about issues. And so, I remember very clearly, um, I had friends who, had, who were dying in the early years of AIDS, but more importantly, as a college president, I had a number of employees. Hunter College is in Manhattan, for those of you that aren't from New York, at 69th and Park Avenue. It was in many ways in the center of uh, the AIDS crisis. I had numerous employees that got sick during that period, and while I've never said it publicly, I actually repeatedly broke the law to extend the benefits of those employees so they would be uh, taken care of during their end of life because they obviously couldn't uh, come to work. <laughs> the man who was going to become Assistant Secretary for Health, who actually originally came just to coach me in public health, because I had come from Wisconsin, I knew I knew the FDA and the CDC and the NIH. I had actually sat on the director's council at the NIH. I knew welfare and Medicaid and Medicare, but I wasn't as familiar with the whole area of public health and the public health commissioned uh, officers. So I coaxed Phil Lee out of retirement. He had been an assistant secretary of health in both the Carter and the Johnson administrations. He was by that time in his 70s and I coached him to come back from San Francisco. He had been chancellor of the University of California at San Francisco, had been uh, one of the great leaders in public health in this country. The fact that he came from San Francisco and had been deeply rooted um, in the AIDS crisis in San Francisco made a huge difference. But there was something else that made a difference. 
Phil Lee, whose own sister had died from liver disease caused by a hepatitis-tainted transfusion, understood the blood crisis and the tainted blood issue like no one else um, that was going to come into the administration. And finally, before I talk about the people that were already at uh, HHS, Patsy Fleming, who became assistant to the secretary uh, for, to focus on AIDS, um, was a longtime friend of mine from New York um, who came from the Hill. She had actually worked for Congressman Ted Weiss, who was also, and had, had helped shape some of the early legislation and some of the early conference reports <coughs> Um, on AIDS. Um, and so Patsy and Phil, with my own experience with the president's prodding, Patsy would eventually go to the White House as the president's uh, AIDS coordinator, but she had spent a decade working on the AIDS issue. Phil Lee had been deeply rooted in the issue and knew the blood issue as well. And then of course, Tony Fauci, and David Kessler, and then eventually Car Harold Varmus and David Satcher at CDC, all of these, um, all of those men understood the AIDS crisis, understood the blood issues in particular. At Wisconsin, I have been tutored by Howard Temin, the Nobel laureate, who uh, was the, played a crucial role in identifying the AIDS virus. Um, and. Uh, Howard and I had numerous conversations about the evolution of the funding for AIDS, about the blood uh, issue. Uh, by 86, we were at least testing uh, the blood. So our backgrounds fit with taking on the issue for the, uh, for the administration. But what seared the blood, the tainted blood issue in my mind was Tony Fauci arriving with some children who had been infected with their pictures, the pictures that they had painted. And um, he brought them along with their pictures. I was so moved by my conversations with those children and by Tony's description of the crisis that was at hand that I took their pictures and the pictures of children who had died from tainted blood and and we framed them and put them in the secretary's conference room. The secretary's conference room, which was very large, if any of you remember, was the place where all the major policy decisions were made in healthcare um, in the United States. And I promised the children that those pictures would stay on the wall to remind every official in the administration of what happens when you don't have the courage to make tough decisions and when you're cowed either by industry or uh, by your own reluctance uh, to step out on an issue. It is very true that Senators Kennedy and Graham and Congressman Peter Goss uh, met with me in 1993, very early in 93, uh, to talk about uh, the retrospective issue, about how we were going to learn from mistakes that were made and to encourage the administration to step up on Ricky Gray and to work on the legislation. Uh, Phil Lee and David and Harold and uh, uh, Tony and I were all members of the Institute of Medicine and we thought taking an investigation out of Congress and putting it at the Institute of Medicine became important. Sometimes people throw things to blue ribbon commissions because they want to avoid action on an issue. In our case, we were anxious to learn. Um, I'm sorry that it took so long, but those reports with that commission became very important and setting the basis for the conversation. It didn't take a lot of courage to step up and to hand an issue and an investigation of ourselves uh, to the, and by ourselves, I mean everyone that was in any position of power, uh, to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences. And I don't believe it took a lot of courage on my part um, to either elevate the issue or uh, more importantly, to take the recommendations of that commission and to implement them. And of course, Phil Lee became with 
my keeping my promise, he became the first, uh, basically, blood czar uh, of the department. While he had other things to do, the appointment of, uh, appointment of Phil Lee, the most senior health official in the administration, the, that initial appointment, I thought, sent a very clear message that we were not messing around and that we intended to step forward on the issue, as we did on the general AIDS issues uh, across the administration. I have no excuse for government and government officials not making tough decisions. Even when David Kessler brought to us uh, a decision um, uh, to have a more sensitive test for HIV, um, and some experts uh, objected because of the costs, we sided with Kessler. Whenever there was an opportunity to step forward or to make a tougher decision, we were determined that we would not make the mistakes of our predecessors, that money would not be the object for saving lives. And I think in large part, it was not simply because we were first-class policy analysts because all of us had a background, but because we actually had personal experience. We knew kids, we knew adults, we had friends, we had neighbors who had died from government inaction, from their inability to act on information they were given by CDC and later by the Food and Drug Administration. And the other thing that I instituted in the department was that the large public agencies, uh, the National Institutes of Health, um, the Centers for Disease Control, and the FDA, I gave them direct access to me. If David Kessler wanted to get through to the secretary, he could get through in minutes, no matter where I was. That was also true of the CDC, as well as the NIH. Never again would something get pushed down into the bureaucracy Never again would they have to send a piece of paper up through the process to have a conversation with the secretary about something that would save lives um, in the United States. So both on the management side, on the new initiative side, working with Congress on Ricky Ray, and on responding and admitting the mistakes that were made and on learning from that mistakes, I believe that we took firm action. My friend, the late Maya Angelou, once wrote, if you're for the right thing, then you do it without thinking. We did the right thing two decades ago with the Ricky Ray uh, Relief Fund Act, and I hope that we're continuing to do so today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Ellen Riker. I think most of you know me. Um, I'm the federal policy advisor for NHF um, and have had the honor to serve the community um, since 1989. So um, it's, it's very, very heartening and fulfilling to hear the session today, um, uh, having lived through it uh, and being where we are. I have the pleasure to introduce three more individuals that were intimately involved in the Institute of Medicine study and the Ricky Ray Act back in 1994. Um, let me begin with Wendy Selig, who's sitting next to Dr. Shalera. Wendy is now the president and CEO of the Melanoma Research Alliance. It's a public charity focused on finding and funding 
uh, promising melanoma research worldwide to accelerate progress towards a cure. Um, it's the largest private funder of melanoma research. I thought I'd put that in there. Eight to ten million dollars in research. Um, back in um, 1994, uh, um, actually from 89 to 2000, Wendy worked for Congressman Porter Goss. Um, Porter Goss was a Republican congressman from the state of Florida, and he um, helped to ask for the Institute of Medicine study, as well as introduce the Ricky Ray Act in the House. Next to Wendy is Dr. Mike Stoto. Mike is a professor of health systems administration and population health at Georgetown University, and an adjunct professor of biostatistics at Harvard School of Public Health. Back in 1994, um, Mike was the director of the Institute of Medicine's Division um, of Health Promotion and Disease Pre Prevention and was one of the lead staff people uh, working with the panel that wrote the report, HIV in the Blood Supply. And then finally um, is Mr. Bruce Leslie. Uh, Bruce is a president of a group called First Focus. It's a bipartisan advocacy organization uh, dedicated to making children and families a priority in uh, federal policy and budget decisions. Bruce, in 1994, worked for Senator Bob Graham of Florida, Democratic senator, and was instrumental in the Institute of Medicine study and um, the Ricky Ray Relief Act in the Senate. Um, what's clear, it was a very bipartisan effort um, I am really pleased that these three individuals um, are joining us today. We're trying to keep this kind of personal, so I've asked each of them um, to tell us a little bit about their work and how our community impacted their lives. Mike, I'm going to start with you because the study came before the legislation. Um, so I thought I'd let Mike go first, then we'll go to Wendy and then Bruce. Can you yes. hear? Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you, and uh, thank you all for, for coming. And it was really interesting to hear uh, these perspectives, and hope I can add something to it. So, 20 years ago at this time, um, I was actually the newly appointed staff director of the Iowa Board of Health Promotion and Disease Prevention. And I remember a letter from uh, Secretary Shalala coming asking for this study, and I had the opportunity and the privilege, really, to help craft the approach that the IOM took to doing this and to help prepare the report on um, HIV in the blood supply. So, um, but of course, I didn't know anything about hemophilia or um, blood disease or, or, or things like that at, at the time. I did know a little bit about um, AIDS as it was developing. Um, but looking back and, and going beyond the specifics of this particular uh, case, I think the most important lesson that we learned um, from this, um, beyond the recommendations of the report, about the ch were about the challenges of making decisions under uncertainty. Um, you know, looking back now, um, it's, it's absolutely clear that HIV uh, could be spread, spread through blood and blood products. But in the mid-80s, in the period we're talking about, it was far from clear. Uh, the evidence was based on epidemi epidemiological patterns. And even at, at the time, we didn't even have the word HIV. Um, we didn't know about the virus um, um, early on. And the fact is that similar um, outbreak reports, as we now call them, like this come up all the time, and most of them turn out to really be nothing, to have no major health uh, impact. Um, one of the most important ones, I think, was back in 1976, when there was a, uh, a scare about the emergence of swine flu, basically the same thing that actually happened in 2009, uh, which led to the development of a national vaccine um, campaign. Um, and, and then there was no pandemic, uh, but probably some people were harmed by, by, by the vaccine. Um, well, and all of this, I think, gave uh, public health uh, a black eye. And I often wonder whether or not uh, the fact that some of the same people at CDC who were um, bringing that to everyone's attention um, were regarded as having cried wolf, and whether that slowed down the response to um, HIV in, in, in the 80s. But the other thing to bear in mind is that at this time, 
um, blood products were really new, and people were calling them wonder drugs or a magic bullet. They talked about the scourge of hemophilia and how these things were really going to change things, had already changed things. And so given the weakness of the evidence, and on the other hand, the clear benefits of these new products, it's understandable and maybe even expected that the people would discount the risk associated um, with, with these new products. Um, acknowledging the uncertain risk uh, about um, the blood products uh, really meant denying the benefits um, to the patients who were clearly benefiting from them. That's the way it was, it was presented. Now, I think that a better response back then, and also, of course, in similar circumstances going forward, would have involved two steps. First, to get more information about the risk. Rather than denying it, um, develop studies to better describe it and characterize it and understand it. Um, and then second, to take prudent steps to balance these risks and benefits. So, uh, for instance, you might continue using these blood products to tr treat life-threatening bleeding events, um, but maybe restrict their use for prophylactic um, purposes. Or make, really make sure that the, the um, people um, undertake safe sex and so on to prevent the, uh, the risk um, if they needed, really did need to use it. This really is an example of what's called the precautionary principle that's commonly applied in dealing with environmental risk, but I think applies here um, as well. Now, the other thing I think that can be learned from this, this study was really how to do a retrospective analysis of a public health crisis. Um, in our work at, at, at the IMWM, we learned from um, Harvey Feinberg and Dick Neustadt's analysis of 1976 swine flu, which is really a, a tremendous uh, story. Um, and my current research um, is, uh, involves trying to apply similar methods to learn from uh, public health uh, uh, pandemics and disasters and, uh, and things like that. One of the lessons that we learned from this is how it's important to avoid Monday morning quarterbacking, but rather the need to analyze a decision based on what was known at the time. It's really easy to say, well, you should have seen that, but, but in fact, often it's not quite that easy uh, as all. Well. For instance, don't assume that HIV was transmitted through blood products, which wasn't clear at the time. Second lesson, I think, is to go beyond the specific decisions and the actions and really get at the root causes to understand, you know, what about this um, led to the problem that can be uh, fixed so that it helps us to do better uh, the next time through. So, for instance, it really wasn't about the specifics of different ways of testing um, blood for hepatitis and uh, other things that, that the focus was on, but really that there was no method to directly screen uh, for the pathogen that was actually responsible and the need to find a way uh, to do that. And then the final point, I think, is that it's important to look at an event like this from a variety of perspectives and to take everyone's view seriously. Um, it's uh, to know, uh, we need to know who knew what um, and what were their concerns and what, how they made decisions uh, and so on. I think a lot of people felt that um, when we started this study that people wouldn't talk to us. They wouldn't tell us um, what, what was going on. Uh, but in fact, what we found was quite the opposite, that everyone wanted to talk to us. Um, <laughs> it's just that they all had different things to say, and everyone had a different perspective on the issue. And I think that what it really took, and I think it's something that we, need, we should do going forward, is the kind of thing that the IOM can do, is to bring in some neutral parties who weren't involved to help bring all those perspectives together and learn something from them that, that we all, can all benefit from. Thank you. Thank you. Wendy? Good morning, everybody, and, and thank you, uh, Val and, and Alan and Dana and my colleagues over here and, and Secretary Shalala. It's, um, it's a real privilege to be here, and um, when I think about my career, and um, it was interesting, uh, Secretary Shalala, talking about people's backgrounds and sort of where they came from before they got involved, we got involved with this issue. I, I do think it's really relevant, and I think about my own background. So. Um, there I was working as a staff person for Congressman Porter Goss, who um, was representing the Gulf Coast of Florida at the time, including Sarasota, Florida, which, uh, as you may know, is where the Ray family ultimately settled after having lived through a truly awful series of events uh, involving their home being burned. And, you know, again, uh, trying not to be judgmental looking back because that, that seems unfathomable today, uh, at the height of the HIV and AIDS crisis in the 1980s. Uh, there was so much fear, there was so much misinformation, lack of information, lack of understanding, 
uh, about this emerging public health threat. Um, and here was a family with, with four children, three boys, um, and you know they were not allowed to go to school and their house was ultimately burned and they fled uh, one part of Florida and ended up in Sarasota, Florida, where I'm, I'm happy to say uh, they were our constituents there um, and the community welcomed them. Um, so there I was, um, a relatively young staffer uh, with a background in journalism. And I think, as I think back to how, how I got involved in this and, and, and approached it, I think my training in journalism might have, might have had something to do with, with my sort of dog with a bone attitude about understanding what was going on here and trying to do something about it. Um, so the Ray family uh, met with uh, my boss and to his great credit, um, he really, um, you know, he wasn't, this wasn't his area of expertise either. Uh, did not come from the health background. I didn't have a health background. I wasn't even the healthcare staffer. Um, but this sort of took hold for us as something, something well beyond constituent service to try to understand uh, what had happened and more importantly, what could be done about it. And then of course, getting to meet Dana and Val and Alan and Shannon Pemberthy, who's here somewhere. Uh, and Corey Dubin, and, and a whole um, list of folks, a relatively small group of people at that time. Um, and I too had a box of documents. Uh, I was listening to Dana talk about these documents, and I protected the several boxes. Those, bo those documents were so important to me because they really told the story, um, which ultimately informed um, the work that happened afterwards. Um, but I have to say, at the beginning, uh, I had sort of been sort of kind of pulled into this idea that there must be someone, something, some entity, some company to blame. That this was such a tragic story of uh, what had happened to a community of people. Um, and so it started almost with this idea of the smoking gun. But I think as time went on and as we worked on it, um, it really became much more about acknowledging that people didn't know everything that we wish they had known to make the best decisions, that people were harmed, families suffered, and more importantly, that we had to improve the systems and processes in place to make sure that this wouldn't keep going in the future. So I think it went from constituent hurting, do something, blame, anger, accountability, to really trying to do something much bigger than, than um, just making it right for the individuals, although that was obviously very, very important. Um, and I, you know, I, I think um, Porter Goss and Bob Graham and Mike DeWine um, as the three sort of Senate and House congressional leaders and then working with the committee chairs and ranking members and the committee staff who took it on from the congressional perspective um, you know, these, these, especially these three Senate individuals, uh, Senate and House individuals, my boss and Bruce's boss and Senator DeWine, really deserve a lot of credit uh, for taking on an issue that required them um, as legislators to learn a lot about some very, very complex and arcane topics and to move something forward. And, and I was really proud to be part of that effort. Um, I, I think I'd also like to just say that um, I didn't know much about HIV and I knew nothing about hemophilia when this project kind of landed on, you know, in our office um, and, I, and I took it on. Um, the only thing that I really knew about HIV and AIDS, I, I had, other than reading the papers and, and feeling, you know, a little terrified, was uh, when I was in journalism school in Chicago at Northwestern, I did, a, um, I did a piece about um, sort of the underground community of people trying to take drugs and learn things and, and fight off this disease. And I did a series of interviews about, about it. And I can tell you, nothing was ever discussed in that project about the blood supply. And um, so, you know, uh, it, was, it was a big surprise to me when, when this landed on my lap. Um, but one of the things that I, that I just wanted to, to mention is about how important it is, no matter what you're advocating for or working on, to understand that it's, not, it's important, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient to be right and to have the right, to, be, to have a cause that is, that is right and just. 
It's critically important. Um, clearly, this was a community of people who had suffered greatly, uh, families who had lost loved ones, people who were suffering and sick, um, families who were being ostracized in their communities and all the rest, people who felt like they had been misled or lied to, all of those things that kind of go into that. And clearly, we were, we were in the right to try to do something, uh, but it wasn't enough. We also had to do our homework. We had to, have, we had to explain why this had happened and, and what needed to be fixed in order to prevent it from happening again, where the system failures had been. Um, you know, so we really had to get smart, we had to be educated. Uh, this became you know, full-time jobs, really, for a lot of us who were working on this. And we had to be incredibly persistent. I remember hearing, uh, you know, I got to Congress as a staffer, I was very idealistic. I thought, you know, you just you go in there, you're right, you do your homework, you get a bill passed. Well, uh, it doesn't quite work that way, and I think we all know <laughs> that the, the system is set up so that it, you know, unless you really, 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 really work hard and are persistent all the way through and take setbacks and find new ways around, um, things won't happen. And so I really credit this community and the leadership who worked on this with the persistence to keep at it, to keep going back to it, to find new ways to elevate the issue. Dana mentioned the DECA students, and I spent a lot of time with them, Distributed Ed Educational Clubs of America. I'd never heard of them either, by the way, <laughs> before that. Um, and there was particularly a group, and I'm so sorry, I'm not remembering the name of their teacher at Robinson Secondary School in Virginia. Um, and that group of kids took on the Ricky Ray Hemophilia Act as their project. And I had the, the honor of being invited out to that high school to speak to these kids. And they made signs, and they made buttons, and they did all kinds of things, and they came up and we did rallies on the, on the Capitol steps. And it was incredible to see a group of young people who really felt that they were making a difference and could make a difference, and ultimately, the bill got done. You know, so what a lifetime, what a life-changing experience for this group of kids, uh, most of whom had probably never really heard of hemophilia, didn't know anything about these issues, but they made it their business to find out. So this issue touched so many people well beyond the community, and I think the persistence is so critically important. And I take that with me today in what I'm doing. I'm still in the health field and, and working on other similar issues, but the lessons are the same. Um, it's about individuals, it's about courageous leaders who are willing to stand up and ask for answers and demand accountability and, and get people to work together. Um, but it's also about having that passion and willingness to keep, to keep working at it. Um, the last thing I want to say is that, you know, government gets a bad name um, often. And those of us who have been in government service, I think, recognize that, um, you know, our public servants are not always held in the highest esteem, and often rightly so. Uh, government is cumbersome and clunky and slow and can be maddeningly complex um, and inefficient. But there are times when government gets it right. Mm -hmm. And I think this whole story from the beginning uh, of the action through the Secretary's Office, through the IOM, through the legislative process, and then the implementation of the legislation uh, is a great example that I'm very proud of. Here was a a program that was implemented. Um, it completed its work for less than the amount of money that was provided for it. And then it completed its work and it went away as it should. And I think that is something that I am very proud to have been involved in. And so I want to thank you. Uh, thank you all again. And um, it's, it's a real honor to be here. Thank you. Um, so I, when I started with uh, Senator Graham, um, he had already, uh, Ricky Ray had already passed away, and so um, I never got to have the pleasure of meeting uh, Ricky Ray, and his, but I did know his family, I met his family, I believe, the first week I was on the job, and um, they educated me about um, his life, his commitment, and um, so I just wanted to read from you, um, the important thing is what, his, is that that child impact on Senator Graham. 
So Senator Graham had been uh, previously been the governor of Florida, um, and he was he does these work days, and so he was in um, Sarasota at one point and met the Ray family, and met Ricky Ray, and so Ricky Ray had this conversation with him, and so in March of 1994, um, um, Sir Graham gave a floor statement, so I'd like to read from that because that really talks about his um, his involvement in this issue, and so as he said on the floor of the Senate. On December 13, 1992, Ricky Ray, a teenage boy in East Orange County, Florida, died at home after his six-year battle against AIDS and 15-year or lifelong battle with hemophilia. I attended Ricky's funeral later that week and read a letter from then-President-elect Bill Clinton, who, like I, was profoundly affected by this incredible human being and his family. And he goes on to say, in remembering Ricky, words such as perseverance and wisdom come to mind. Ricky and his family have, since that revelation in 1986, that he had contract, contracted uh, the AIDS virus, lived with the pain and question caused by the virus. If that is not enough, there was also the pain of being banned from school in 1987, having their home burned down by an arsonist shortly thereafter, and spending a tremendous amount of time in court fighting with the De DeSoto County School District and the pharmaceutical companies that sold the Ray family the contaminated blood products. Despite it all, Ricky was committed to teach others about his disease. His mother, Louise Ray, said of Ricky in an article in the St. Petersburg Times, he believed that his track in life was to educate people about a disease that nobody knew about. He believed that was his purpose. Um, so when I met, met the Ray family, um, and they, it, it's sort of, to me, the story is one about the power of one, you know, one kid and his impact. Um, and how that spread. And so you can talk about it being the power of real people. I met um, amazing people through this process. A lot of you in this room, um, um, a lot of people here, here up here and people that Wendy spoke to, spoke about. Um, and then one of my first meetings actually when I started working for Sid Graham was actually with Senator, Secretary Shalala and um, the people of the Department of Human Services and the commitment that they had to this issue as well um, was, was an incredible thing. And, um, and last was sort of the perseverance and persistence of everybody. Um, it is, the legislative process is very difficult. And, um, and, it, and this process was several steps. We had to um, get people to understand about the disease. We then submitted the letter. And so just to tell you a little bit about, in the letter that we wrote, we wrote, um, it was a letter from uh, Senator Graham and, and Congressman Goss. And we wrote, our mission is twofold here. First, it is critical to make sure the nation's blood supply and our supply of life-saving blood clotting factor is now free of HIV contamination. Second, we believe we owe it to those who are infected and their families to find out what went wrong. Um, I, I would say that the secretary is a hero for um, referring this to the IOM because we, did, we initially did, that wasn't our request. We asked the department to do so. And I think in my career over time, institutions are notoriously horrible in investigating themselves. You can look at um, Penn State, for example, or any kind of instance around abuse or um, you know, government um, or institutional you know, cover-ups on things. And it is to the credit of the department that they said, hey, we want you to look at the practices of what happened and what this department did right or wrong and, and across the agency. Um, so I think, I think that was, uh, a, an amazing thing, and, and the, the report came out, and immediately Wendy and I well, worked with um, Senator DeWine's office um, and, and the committee staffs, and with all of you in the community on, on this legislation. And, um, and and it was a, it was a, it was a long process. I mean, we introduced the bill, and it took many, several years to pass, and then it took you know another period of time to get the, the appropriations, and um, and so it really is also that that story of perseverance and persistence by everyone. And I just want to leave you with one last thing that, um, that Senator Graham said um, in his, his statement about uh, Ricky Ray. Um, and I think this really um, tells a story because I think that his life lives on through this process. Um, uh, when, uh, when there was a, a story in the newspaper, in the local newspaper, when he uh, contracted AIDS, um, and knew he was, he was going to die. There was a, a story that ran in the paper that said, when Ricky saw the headline that Ryan White loses battle with AIDS, he was very upset. 
as quoted by the, 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 uh, the newspaper, he said to his mother, if I die, don't let them write that about me. Don't let them say I lost. Just because you die, that doesn't mean you gave up. That doesn't mean you lost. And I think that he's right. Um, and his call for answers, his call to help people with AIDS, and his fight for the safety of the blood supply has been uh, uh, successful and it lives on today through all the work that you all do. So thank you very much. Thank you, all four of you, um, for the work you did 20 years ago, for the work you continue to do today, um, and for taking the time to talk to kind of our new community. We got old friends and new friends here. And um, I'm going to take some questions from the floor. I see one mic here. If people want to come up, or if not, do it from your seat, and I'll repeat the question um, so everybody can hear. Um, so I'll take a raise of hands, but maybe to get started, um, our community was pretty proud of the fact that from the Institute of Medicine report coming out to the passage of Ricky Ray to fully funding the compensation fund um, was a period of six years. You know, there are other reparation bills that take decades um, to accomplish. What do you think um, we did right? Because we are actively advocating still today on health reform and all those kind of issues. And um, looking back, you know, what could we have done differently? And I'm going to try to get you another mic that works too. So if you want to. Yeah, you want to well, first of all, it was in the larger context of the AIDS crisis. So um, there was momentum there, but it also had a human face. It had these incredibly articulate kids who were fighting for all the other kids in the country. And I think that made uh, a big difference. And the bipartisan aspect of it. Porter Goss was incredibly important as part of this. And the fact that um, the senator from Florida and the congressman from Florida, that they didn't come out of New York or San Francisco, I think helped uh, somewhat. And I think what the IOM report uh, did was um, and, and the government was willing to take responsibility for decisions that had been made, even though it was a complex context. Mm -hmm. And by throwing it to the IOM, we, um, we made certain that it was a, a, a nonpartisan review of the situation. Though um, I think that everybody recognizes I can't think of a decision I ever made in public life in which I had every bit of fact. That you just don't have time to wait for that in many ways. And sometimes you can't even get them, get everything. So it's always a judgment call. It's always making sure you have the right people around the table and enough people around the table um, that you're making a thoughtful uh, decision. And uh, as indicated, some of the decision making was clouded by, was this a gay man's disease, the earlier context, and some of it was an earlier experience with swine flu that set a concern. And, um, and you know, it's, you're always taking a risk there. It's always a risk, and it's, I used to say to people in the Clinton administration, because people were staying up all night at the White House, the president hired us for our judgment, not for our stamina. And, and that you have to, I tell my staff now, you have to be rested to make good decisions because you have to consider all of the evidence. But at the end of the day, you can't say, I don't have enough information when people are dying. You just, you just have to step forward. So I think it was a confluence of the right leaders at the right time, particularly in Congress, and the face of it. But you can't underestimate the importance of bipartisanship. Um, you know, one thing that I think was a really big hurdle that um, we worked on a lot, do you remember that board precedent? <laughs> um, you know, 
I had had an experience prior to getting into this issue involving another situation with a government program that had, had not been carried out well and people were harmed. And I learned a lot, I'm not a lawyer, but I learned a lot from my colleagues at the Judiciary Committee about how you know, the government is, is not to be held liable. And so what we were trying to do here with this bill, that some people use the word reparation, but this bill for compensation um, was actually establishing a precedent too. And so, you know, I would say that one thing the community did very well, um, not only telling the story and the human face, but the advocates in the community got very smart on the legal issues and the way to answer those very difficult questions of, you know, well, this is terrible and everybody acknowledges that this is terrible, this has happened, but, you know, it's a leap then to say government should provide a compensation program. And so I think, you know, you gotta, you've gotta have the, the passion and the story, but you've also gotta do the hard work to get smart. And um, over there are some of the smartest people on the law and the minutia of the law. Um, and you guys aren't lawyers either down there, but, but you, had, you had to be, and you had, there aren't any shortcuts when it comes to that. So I would say that um, in addition to um, the words that other people talked about, it, and uh, it, I think that the coming together, I think it was very difficult um, at the time because people were, there was a lot of different ways to attack this issue, right? There was, I, I, there was lawsuits that were you know, to, against manufacturers, there was you know, the government angle, um, and people had different views on that. And so even though people disagreed, about the tactic, um, they didn't get bogged down in that. They, 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 people stayed focused on the, the overall goal of addressing the problem and making sure that um, the issue and, and the issue around safety was, was paramount. And so I think that was, that was, that was a very key, key thing because um, so often in, in policy and politics, people get, um, people, people get in such fights over the tactic that, that they, they, and nothing ends up happening. Um, and people, people stop talking to each other over such, such things. So even though, even though, for example, at the time, I, you know, I recall people, even, even in the community, there was a very disparate way, you know, views on how to, to attack this issue. Um, people stay true to the, to the overall mission and, and didn't get bogged down in the tactics. And I think that was, um, and, and really kind of did all the policy above. You know, people, people attacked all those different avenues and, and I think that's what really made it successful. I, I'd like to um, add, add one thing. It, it really um, struck me when, when Dana was showing the conclusions from our, our, our report, how they were phrased in the passive voice. Opportunities were lost. And um, I can't say that this was a deliberate strategy or even that we were aware of it, but, but one thing that we did was we kept it away from being ad hominem attacks or even this company or that agency or right. anything like that. The system didn't work. Right. Um, and that I think provided an opportunity to fix the system right. that otherwise wouldn't have been quite so easy. Right. And, and it's funny, having lived through it, I wanna add to Bruce's comments. Um, members also got very creative. Uh, we were talking about when the Senate took up the Ricky Ray Act, the chairman of the committee didn't like the version of the bill that, the, uh, that was introduced by Senator Mike DeWine. And um, I do wanna take a minute to credit Senator Ted Kennedy for telling the chairman, why don't we pass both bills? Just to keep it going. We, w we don't wanna stop this effort. So um, the Senate committee actually passed two versions of the Ricky Ray Act. Um, so that it would keep moving forward. Um, we also had a Congress that was Republican, you know, at the time, both in the House and Senate. Um, and the other anecdote I'll throw out there is that the Senate, or the House Judiciary Committee, the, the subcommittee chairman just wasn't gonna move the bill. Just wasn't gonna move the bill, you know? And it was like, you had introduced it, we had gone through two Congresses, we had about a hundred and some co-sponsors, and as Val 
said he, he worked with us and I said, well, we need somebody who knows Chairman Henry Hyde, Republican of Illinois. He's the only person who could tell a subcommittee chairman, you've got him, I'm gonna move the bill if you're not. And uh, we found the guy he plays pinochle with, you know? <laughs> and God love it, um, his daughter <laughs> came to Washington with her son with hemophilia and we were able to get the, what they call it, the subcommittee was discharged and the full committee took up the bill. So um, there are a lot of individuals that play just a marvelous role in making this happen. Um, and, um, it's, and I love the idea too, the power of one, the power of many. I mean, it really, um, uh, we needed all of you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Larry Allen. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm the secretary for the committee of 10,000. Um, I wanted to make a short comment from the executive committee. We wanted to thank the NHF for sponsoring this important event, along with HFA's recent <clears throat> unveiling of their history room. This important historical session is a testament to our growing single voice in the critical issues of the day. We also commend NHF's Medical and Scientific Advisory Committee as a repository of best practices in the treatment and care of hemophilia. Um, I initially served two terms on <clears throat> the Blood, Product, Blood Safety Availability Committee with Dana. Uh, my family has sickle cell, but during that time on that committee, uh, people like Dana, Corey Dubin, Jan Hamilton, and others discussed the history of hemophilia and there were concerns about we were the next ones to have an issue with blood and blood safety. Um, we're also pleased that uh, many of the treatment centers are now expanding the tent of access to treatment and care, and we look forward to working with NHF and HFA at enshrining this critical history and all that have passed. During um, 1989 to about 2004, COT lost about 60% of their board members. And you know, this is important for this history be, to be uh, documented and for us to pass it on and educate, because there's so many that don't understand and don't know about this history. Uh, and as <clears throat> we'd also want to thank the secretary. Uh, thank you, because under your time as secretary, we were able to do some things, uh, like your signature on the adoption of reports that led to the passing of the Ricky Ray bill. And, uh, we also wanted to thank uh, Congressman uh, Goss, uh, who Corey says the friend without his extensive efforts is simply wouldn't have succeeded. To Bruce Leslie, Wendy Salick, uh, to name a, a few, oh, they were two of the best staffers we could have hoped for, and they, they wanted to thank you for that, uh, Mr. Secretary. And we look forward to working together to proceed to continue to preserve these critical issues and details. So again, we just wanted to thank you. And to those that don't know, Dana served from about 89, I think, 84, to 90 to 2001 uh, as the legislative uh, director for COT. And it was during that time working with Dana and working across the table with Dana on the blood safety that I learned so much about sickle cell and what could happen to us in our community. So again, we wanted to thank everyone for putting this together and we appreciate being a part of this. Thank you. Hi, my name is Karen Cross. Um, and we wanna thank all of y'all for being such wonderful leaders. But we have a lot of old timers who are still in this room, who have fought this fight, this fight and we're still fighting. And I'd like for them to stand up so we can acknowledge them. Would y'all all stand up who were going to the Hill at that time in legislating? Linda Lewis, Andy. And we want to thank y'all all for being here because we don't want history to repeat itself. And as long as we all continue to advocate, it won't happen again. 
Thank you. Maybe one last question, and Karen made me think of it, is kind of where we stand today. How do we prevent things like what happened back then from occurring again? Um, or kind of a, 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 a theme that I hear throughout is kind of how do you make decisions when you don't have good information? And, and maybe that's the, the bigger challenge because that's what we really are continually faced. Just anything in kind of looking today in hindsight or? Well, I, I, think that, I think that the question I think that the question of how to deal with that really is fundamental, and, and Secretary Shelley is right that sometimes you just have to make the decision right then. But oftentimes that decision can be, we're going to do this now, and then we're going to get more information so we can do better next week or next year or wh whatever it is. Um, just having to make the decision now doesn't mean that you can forget about getting more information. You have to do both. Not like locking the decision in, yeah. Exactly right. That you sh that's what we mean by having, by staying on an issue. Um, that that you make decisions with the information you have at the time, but you don't let go of it when there's such a disaster uh, going on. And the other thing is, we just we just have a more sophisticated way of making decisions now. We have ways of getting information and of processing it because of computers and because of modern technology um, that we've never had before so that we can add, we can synthesize, we can add things, we can do things much more quickly um, than we could certainly um, in the early 90s. I mean, I remember walking into HHS and looking down at the secretary's desk and saying, what is that? It was a typewriter. <laughs> I came from the University of Wisconsin. We didn't have any typewriters left. I mean, we were all on computers, but we were still using big computers as opposed to just the desktops. We could just, we could just process information in different ways. But then at the end, the people making decisions have to have context, have to have a sense of history. How we educate public leaders and public decision makers become important, the kind of respect they have for institutions. And if you keep beating down government, you're not going to be able to attract people and make it difficult for people to get confirmed. You're not going to be able to attract people. One of my hobby horses is that we're starting to get to the point where if you don't have anything on your resume, you're more likely to get confirmed than <laughs> you want people with long resumes who have made mistakes to lead uh, in this country. Um, you want people that are seasoned that have been beaten up um, to lead in this country, and we can't have processes that make that difficult. I think um, one thing that's really, just thinking about the typewriter, um, you know, if you think about when we, when we did this, uh, we didn't really even, you know, the internet was just emerging, right. email, uh, iPhones, you know, the, the ability, social media didn't exist. Um, so I think the, the role of patient advocates uh, not the role, but the, the way in which patient advocacy is conducted going forward is uh, very different and in many ways um, easier to get your message across. But I would just caution that I think one of the things that made this process work were the relationships that were created uh, by people getting in a room together and hashing things out together, getting to know one another across you know, the capital, across the, the political spectrum, with the administration, within your community. Uh, you know, there were, you know, everybody eventually worked together, but there were differing views for sure and being in a room together. And so I think, you know, taking advantage of the technology going forward to make sure that all of this uh, history is not just in a cardboard box somewhere, but is really a living history so we can keep learning from it. But don't forget about those personal relationships. Uh, that woman whose father played pinochle with Henry Hyde needed to physically go and have a personal conversation in order, and that's, that's, the, that's the brilliance and the beauty still of our system, and I don't think any technology is going to change that. The problem is 
that the ethics people today probably wouldn't allow that Pinocchio game to take place. <laughs> <laughs> it would have to be uh, under $10 and finger food, right? No plates, no forks. Um, um, I, I would add one other thing, and, and that is, um, I didn't learn a lot from my undergraduate degree in political science, I have to say. Uh, when I got to, to the Hill, I was like, this is not how I was taught this works. Um, but I will say I had one professor who talked about, um, he, he kind of had a theory on, on uh, political science that he was, they talked about windows of opportunity opening and closing. And I think that one of the things that's, that is powerful about you all being here and, and talking to members of Congress is keeping the issues um, and, the, and the agenda that you have before people and, and, and staff will remember that and when windows of opportunity present and to give you an example. So I worked on, um, I certainly worked on this bill during my, my uh, period in Congress, but um, in the interim, one of the things I also learned from the community was um, the importance of you know uh, eliminating lifetime caps yeah. and uh, annual caps and and those kinds of issues of, of uh, and for pe for for people and so when I was working on the hill in the also during this period of time the children's health insurance program um, came before Congress and we had a lot of conversations about about that and um, Having, having learned about these issues um, and, and my time having worked at a public hospital as well, um, there was lots of conversations about what the, the package should look like and whether it should mirror private sector health plans. And one of the things that was, it was in conversation was um, if it mirrors private sector health plans, they had those things, so should we do the same? And Congress, you know, from those of us who had been educated by you all and other other groups, cancer groups, et cetera, um, that window of opportunity opened on the children's health insurance program, and so we were like, no, like um, um, it should actually be more like Medicaid, where there are no such things. And and so um, I was in a Senate conversation where we talked about you know people with you know persons with hemophilia. We talked about people with you know uh, people who had cancer, um, and that really swayed the day. And so. Um, it affects other legislation beyond, you know, uh, and so as you talk to people, know that you're talking about your issues, but you're also um, getting people poised so when there's other windows of opportunity to open, they will, they will know um, what the issues are and be, and, and hopefully do the right thing well, with that knowledge. With that, I have two, two questions, or two things for the audience. First, you have evaluation forms at your table. Don't forget to fill them out, and secondly, Please join me in thanking these four individuals who um, were extremely helpful to our community 20 years ago and uh, shared with us today what, what, it, what it meant to them. Uh, it clearly meant a, a lot to us. Thank you. Thank you.